a city is built up one brick on another, one step at a time. Grains of sand go into concrete. Grains of sand melt into glass. Millions of self-interested acts create a city, a functioning, organic whole. Life works like that, too. The body of a creature springs from billions of decisions taken by protein molecules working out a destiny in nanospace. Our world is full of doorways into nanospace. They're as basic as our senses. Consider iron in red blood cells flowing through our eyes. The same atoms that link together in lightless metals combine to form the mystery of living things. Welcome to nanospace. We're going to journey into the deepest reaches of nanospace to discover some of the many ultra-microscopic dimensions hidden there by living things. As there are worlds within worlds, we'll find lives within lives, down to the nth degree. The vessel of our odyssey, of course, our trusty nanogate, where each floor shrinks us by a factor of ten. still measured in millimeters, like these water fleas. They're food if you happen to be a minnow, predatory monsters from the point of view of a single-celled organism. Oops, I'd forgotten. Nanospace plays tricks. Ms. Nakayama, I'm in your hands. Let me present Shinobu Nakayama who will represent humans, denizens of a world measured in meters. The world measured in millimeters has its own stars. Nematodes from the Greek nema for thread. Billions of millimeter long nematodes feed on bacteria in water and soil. Researchers use these transparent animals to study genetics and cell structure. how a nematode sucks up bacteria. The thing is like a vacuum cleaner. It sucks up one bacterium after another. We're witnessing life balancing life. Zooming in, the bacteria look like salmonella. Uncontrolled, they play a major role in human food poisoning. This is where we discover life within life. Just as salmonella can get into humans and makes food for nematodes, even these intestinal parasites have parasites in them. Parasites on a bacterium three thousandths of a millimeter long look like this. The organisms lined up on the surface of this bacterium are viruses called bacteriophages. We're deep in nanospace now. These phages are two ten millionths of a meter. Structurally, these are among the simplest living things on Earth. Small things play host to smaller things. That's the way of nanospace. simplest living things appeared in what was a very different Earth environment some three and a half billion years ago. Since that time, bodily systems have evolved quite differently as chemical elements such as hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen have combined in many ingenious linkages. Outward forms are very different, but the essential mission 
is the same. To live and to reproduce. Living things are precision machines assembled very differently from a common set of elements. or as a human being, life is a precision machine. Akira Sakata, playing saxophone here, composed the music for this series. He tends to name his bands for living things. Cell Division, the Psychedelic Water Flea Band, and this one, Mitochondria. Setting his music aside, Sakata is a keen student of microbial life in general, and pond life in particular. He spends much of his spare time wading around in a freshwater pond near his home. His special interest is water fleas. Sakata began collecting water fleas in order to feed fish in his home aquarium. Then he started looking at them under the microscope. Once he began studying the workings of their transparent bodies, he rediscovered them as fellow creatures of the earth. <laughs> あの、他の何にも考えなくなっちゃう。で、仕事のこととかさ、そういうことじゃなくて、もうぼーっとこう見てる。で、ある瞬間にふとね、ああ、これ命っていうものはとかね、それDNAとかっていうことを考えたりする
This mechanism may have evolved in order to let another batch of eggs develop in the ovaries before the first has fully formed. In the precarious life of a water flea, doubling its offspring is a valuable mechanism for the species' survival. Confronted with a precarious existence, nature economizes. Female water fleas alone may give birth to young without the need for males. Sometimes as many as 20 eggs are developing in the brood pouch at one time. These eggs are about three days away from hatching. I never cease to be amazed by the exquisite and tiny perfection of life in nanospace. You'd never guess what this thing is. The mouthparts of a mosquito, actually. Her needle-like proboscis is armed with sharp barbs on either side of the tip. She uses her proboscis like a pneumatic drill, shaking her head to drive the bit home. She pierces human skin to tap a blood vessel. she finds that blood vessel, she draws a meal of blood. Female mosquitoes must have a blood meal before they can lay eggs. An electron microscope shows a mosquito's proboscis as a needle enclosed in a covering sheath. In fact, the microscope discovers seven separate mouth parts. The one that meets the eye, of course, is the external sheath. Within this tough external housing, the mosquito's proboscis encloses the entire apparatus of a sophisticated hypodermic needle. Six separate hypodermic components are hidden and protected by the sheath, all of them made of very elastic proteins. When the mosquito's probing for a blood vessel, she can bend her hypodermic needle any which way. part within the sheath is a piercing tool. This has saw-like barbs on either side. Saliva from the green tube prevents blood coagulating and irritates the bite. The red component is the blood-sucking tube. The blue parts on either side prevent blood spilling from the sides. Besides mouth parts, a mosquito's equipment includes sensitive carbon dioxide sensors. The air contains less than 1% carbon dioxide. Mosquitoes can discriminate between atmospheric CO2 and higher concentrations. This organ lets the insect home in on human breath. If that's not enough, Heat sensors at the tips of its antennae allow a mosquito to pinpoint animal bodies very accurately. What with its seven-part proboscis and sensors for carbon dioxide and heat, a mosquito is truly a specialized blood-sucking machine. From mouth to feet, but still in nanospace, a common gecko climbs a pane of glass with the utmost ease. The answer to this mystery, too, lies in the nanospace of life. One would expect the animal's toes to be equipped with suction pads, but it has none. In 
Instead, a huge number of hair-like projections on its toes resemble Velcro. An electron microscope shows that these hair-like projections divide into even finer branches. At their tips, these bristles of living tissue are just a few dozen billionths of a meter across. Nanospace on an animal's foot. We put the gecko on glass, polished to give it an extremely smooth finish. On this glass, even a gecko slides down. We compared this with the gecko's grip on ordinary glass. Ordinary glass on the right looks smooth, but the surface is really a maze of tiny irregularities a few dozen nanometers high. Compared with this, the surface of specially polished glass down which the gecko slid is much smoother. In other words, the gecko's feet have evolved such fine projections that it can grip surfaces with a roughness of just billionths of a meter. Evolution has given us a relatively large animal which is quite at home with nanometers. The nanospace of living things holds many such secrets. Living structures we've seen so far are relatively large, comprising huge, involved assemblages of atoms. And what determines these precise atomic arrangements? We're going to use the structurally simplest of all living things, a virus, to find out. are tobacco mosaic virus, among the simplest of viruses, making them structurally the simplest living things. The organism takes its name from the mosaic patterns of light and dark green that it creates on the leaves of tobacco plants. No more than 300 nanometers long and 18 wide. These simplest of organisms tell us much about the structure of all living things on planet Earth. The tobacco mosaic virus, among the most basic of organisms, shows precisely how atoms assemble themselves into life forms. To begin with, the virus consists of some 2,000 identical protein molecules. If we take a close look at one section, it is clear that molecules arrange themselves in a helical pattern. And each molecule its 2,400 atoms determine its shape. If we analyze one protein molecule with a computer, its structure unravels into single atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Further, we can say that the sequence in which they arrange themselves and the bonding angles between them are precisely determined.
can such a simple organism produce such a complicated protein? Buried in the protein's helical arrangement is the virus's genetic material. It is this which dictates, with the utmost precision, the nature and composition of the protein in the tobacco mosaic virus. The sequence, the code if you like, embedded in its genetic molecule dictates the nature of every protein manufactured by an organism. And that is true of all organisms. Molecules like this are blueprints for creating precise machines out of proteins. In other words, living things. These are viruses that attach themselves to the surface of the bacterium Escherichia coli, hence the name bacteriophage. Scientists everywhere are investigating this tiny particle called a T4 phage to find out exactly how its genetic blueprint governs the manufacture of the organism's proteins. The cryogenic microscope at the Protein Engineering Research Institute in Japan is the most sophisticated of its type in the world. It can resolve detail in biological tissue down to two tenths of a nanometer. To keep tissue as near as possible to its natural state, liquid nitrogen cools it to minus 180 degrees centigrade. In the cryogenic microscope, it will be cooled further, as close as possible to absolute zero. Temperatures prevailing in the deepest reaches of space will help preserve the atomic structure of tissue as it was when it lived. This is the result, the T4 phage through the cryogenic microscope. Its head gives a pattern like that of a fingerprint. Magnified even more, this image turns out to be the phage's DNA, its genetic material. Research like this has given us a detailed picture of how a T4 phage is built on its DNA blueprint. The head of this phage resembles a geodesic dome with 20 facets. Inside, a coiled molecule of genetic material is the organism's reproductive blueprint. The head itself is made of four very specific proteins. phage cannot move independently. It floats in water till it comes in contact with an E. coli bacterium. Then part of its protein changes as the phage anchors itself to the bacterium. Next, as if winding a mechanical spring, the tail in purple changes shape and drives the central core into the bacillus. The phage injects E. coli with its own genetic material. The phage's genetic ribbon breaks down the bacteriums, then begins using the same material to create copies of itself. The newly formed phage genetic molecule starts producing new protein components one after another. First the head, then tail fibers, and so on. The blueprint for the necessary proteins is located at specific sites on the genetic molecule. Only when protein components for new phages have been assembled does the genetic ribbon enter its newly made head. Then the head attaches a tail followed by a tail fibers. The result is a newly made phage. Nature handles this operation with a remarkable economy of effort. 
25 minutes after locking onto a bacterium, the T4 phage has multiplied itself a hundredfold. The T4 phage illustrates the amazing abilities of living beings to reproduce by encoding for their own special proteins. Though we take ourselves for granted, that wonder includes us. For the moment, we're going to look at something more humble than humans. These salmonella bacteria swim around with the aid of protein motors 30 millionths of a meter across. These days, researchers are devoting a lot of time to salmonella. By understanding how bacterial micromotors work, they hope one day to be able to emulate them by building micro-machines. Salmonella, under an electron microscope. The bacterium swims by twining together its six to eight flagellae and rotating them like a propeller. Each flagellum is one hundredth of a millimeter long. At its point of attachment to the cell, it has the smallest rotating motor on Earth, 30 billionths of a meter across. Under an electron microscope, a salmonella motor looks like the sort of tiny electric motor humans might make. To the best of our knowledge, the flagellar motor is built like this. The yellow component is the motor proper. Along with other parts, such as the axis and the axis-bearing rings, it is composed of its own special proteins. How can a bacterium create a high-performance motor? This team of researchers is studying salmonella to discover how we might benefit from understanding this, to us, new protein technology. How does a biological motor work? The team tethered the flagellae of salmonella between glass plates. Now each bacterium, not its flagellum, rotates around its point of attachment. Then researchers took electrical measurements of flagellar motors running. They found that these tiny biological motors, just 30 nanometers across, rotated at 10,000 revolutions a minute. An extraordinary performance. Shinichi Aizawa of Taikyo University Engineering Department. バイクに乗って走ってる速さになるんですね。で、このバイクに乗って走ってる人間の世界ではまあ周りは動きませんけれども、この小さい世界ではですね、まず第一に水の中ですね。で、バクテリアにとって水っていうのはそんなあの我々
An axis made of a different protein grows out of the ring. And then two types of axis bearing rings form up around the axis. On top of this assembly, a hook structure forms, its tip looking something like the calyx of a flower. This will serve to support a flagellum. Below the flower-shaped structure, protein molecules resembling propeller blades attach themselves, one after another, in a helical arrangement. The proteins to build this are created inside the bacterial cell. The flagellar motor assembles itself in just one hour. If we could produce the same 10 or so proteins, we might be able to emulate nature and make the world's smallest man-made motor. This mass of thousands of tiny bacterial motors represents an attempt to do just that. As a first step, salmonella bacteria are broken up chemically and their genetic material extracted. The next step will be to splice the salmonella protein into E. coli cells, which breed, mass-producing protein motor components. But first, this salmonella protein responsible for creating the motors has to be isolated. The end result a batch of salmonella motor rings produced in a strain of E. coli. Using advanced genetic engineering, humans are trying to emulate achievements made by nature, perhaps billions of years ago. precision tools that living things have used for eons. The cell membrane of this nematode gives a clue that may let us build the tiniest computers we'll ever know. Nematodes are common beyond number in soil, fresh and ocean water, on mud, and as human parasites. The female of this nematode species stores up sperm and fertilizes each egg as it leaves her body. The nucleus of a fertilized egg is on the left, the sperm nucleus on the right. The nuclei fuse, bringing their genetic material together. Next, the cell begins to divide, one into two, two into four. Some of the resulting cells are destined to become a mouth, others a digestive tract, and so on. The point is, each cell can tell where to go and what body part to become. It can do this because sensors on its surface detect conditions around it, in essence, guiding it through the crowd. These sensors make possible the complex transformation of a mass of cells into a specific organism. Eleven hours after first cleavage, the fertilized egg has become the 558 cells 
of a perfectly formed hatchling nematode. The orderly cell division was guided by each cell's sensors. Research is only now revealing how they work. A cell's membrane is made of a thin double layer of lipid, or fat, and proteins that float, as it were, in this fatty layer. Membrane proteins include cell surface sensors, up to tens of thousands per cell. Each is a few dozen nanometers across. Computer animation allows us to take a detailed look at a typical cell surface sensor type, the ion channel. This particular ion channel is formed of five spindle-shaped protein blocks. reacts to an external stimulus by opening down the middle, letting ions pass into the cell from the environment. Some ion channels pass sodium ions, others calcium, and so on. The enormous amount of information reaching the cell through thousands of similar channels lets it form an accurate picture of its position with respect to the external environment. This computer-drawn image is based on an electron microscope photograph. Protein molecules like this, 11 billionths of a meter high, lie at the heart of information processing, which guides cells into forming specific beings. Will a cell become part of a mouth or a gut? Its secret, the secret of every cell, is written in the molecular language of nanospace right here. Scientists around the world are researching the possibility of making a biocomputer by harnessing ion channels in cell membranes. Among them, Masahiro Sukabe at the Nagoya University. Sukabe is trying to discover how a single channel works in its natural state. A glass tube, one thousandth of a millimeter across, is driving slowly into the surface of a single cell in the upper right-hand corner of the frame. By lowering the internal pressure in the glass, suction slowly begins pulling a single ion channel from the surface of a cell into the tube. The properties of a single channel drawn in like this can be tested by applying electrical stimuli and mechanical pressure. While this is going on, the flow of ions through the channel is measured as fluctuating electrical currents, analyzed by a computer. Leaving his specimen and addressing himself to the computer, Sokabe can see precisely when the channel opens and when it closes again. In short, when it accepts or rejects chemical stimuli from the outside world. This graph is a record of awareness, if you like, not of a cell, but of a sensor on the surface of a cell. The channel opens to admit external influences and closes again at intervals of about one one thousandth of a second. An ion channel's response is very much like that of a digital computer. It is either open or it's closed. Masahiro Sakabe. 
でそういうことを全部やってのけてるわけですから我々としてはその細胞というのはそれ一つでですね非常に複雑なあのコンピューターの働きをしていると。The fertilized nematode egg again. As soon as the sperm makes contact, electrical changes occur in the cell of that egg. Subsequently, biochemical computers in each cell regulate all changes at every step of the process by which one cell divides into the eventual 558. At that point, of course, the hatchling is a finely developed organism. The body of a living creature may be a vast storehouse of biochemical computers, online, in constant digital communication with each other, and equipped to make decisions. Something in the order of 60 trillion cells make up a human body. Each cell has from a few hundreds to tens of thousands of ion channels in its surface layers. The result? Microcomputers beyond number, collaborating to create and sustain each being as a whole. The epitome of nature's skill and precision in this endeavor becomes each one of us. We inherit the blueprint of life in the form of a fine, double-wound, long molecule called, for short, DNA. The code printed in the linkages of DNA lets water fleas or nematodes or human beings descend from generation to generation, true to form. The role of DNA in the evolution of living things is slowly becoming clear. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Some of the most advanced DNA research in the world is done on this campus. In this laboratory, researchers are trying to find out how a sudden mutation in a nematode can be passed to its offspring through the blueprint of its DNA. Part of the DNA ribbon responsible for the sudden mutation is removed from the animal and drawn into a thin glass needle. As in many things, nature's most powerful secrets come in the smallest packages. Quantity counts for little. The substance in this needle weighs one billionth of a gram. The next step is to inject it into a nematode. Since the intended host is one millimeter long, the task has to be done under a microscope. The DNA being injected was removed from a mutant female, lacking a passage for giving birth to offspring. Taken from the mutant, the gene encoded for this mutation is injected into a normal nematode to see if the same mutation will reappear. Genetic change affects future generations, so no alterations were seen in the treated nematode. The mutation cropped up in its offspring and in subsequent generations. offspring of the DNA altered nematode were born with the original mutation. Without a passage for bearing young, nematodes eggs began hatching inside their parent until females bodies were filled with their offspring. There can be no doubt that genetic information and in DNA was passed to subsequent generations. They study how altering DNA changes proteins and how these changes are handed down. Scientists are finding surprising similarities among all organisms. There 
architecture is remarkably consistent. One nematode, which is one millimeter in length, can be sectioned into 20,000 individual sections. We see that these structures are made of the same proteins that we find in people. And as we study these proteins, as we study the genes that make these proteins, we find that there is a wonderful and striking theme of universality amongst many organisms, that organisms that may appear so different as this microscopic nematode and people are made up of the same kinds of proteins and are made by the same kinds of genes. Life's secrets are written in a long chain molecule called DNA. Human intellect is at last beginning to read the secrets of its origins. DNA came into being perhaps three and a half billion years ago. Over time, its components have changed, producing countless millions of living species. We can never know how many times that number came and went before. To look on nature's workings from its roots in nanospace is to be acutely aware of the lengthy shadow cast by light on the endless flow.